Jack. Welcome to Jumping In. Last time we talked was on episode 13 of our long form Jedberg podcast. And we launched Jumping In not too long ago. This is going to be our third episode, but it provided the opportunity for us to bring back guests that we had in the past, talk about relevant current events. And with what is going on in the world right now with Russia, Ukraine, the chaos over the last eight or nine days, I figured there is no better person to talk to about this than literally America's resident expert on Putin, on, on the Russian aggression than you. Well, that's very flattering. I know a lot of people are going to be annoyed because they really don't believe that. They, they assume they are, but uh, I'm going to be agnostic about that statement. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. Well, I have a book. People. I have a book out. You know, I have a book out. So I, people can make their own judgment. I mean, you know, and I've talked about a spy master's prism. And you and I were just lamenting, you know, the fight against Russian aggression. And, you know, th this is the day it came out last year. You know, this really it makes a world of difference. Last year, it was all in on China. I couldn't get anybody to pay attention to Russia. And, you know, I found it fascinating that in there, because I'd made a trip out there and I'd know a lot of Ukrainians and I called uh, Kiev the uh, the new Berlin and they were going to have a cold war and that Putin was a really dangerous guy and nobody listened. So the moral of the story is you hold your, your book release until the world <laughs> changes, I guess. But I'm happy about it. I'm on record and, I, and, and so on. So I think we're in a even more dangerous place than I imagined. So I think we've got a lot to talk about today. Why now? Why did... President Putin pick this period of time, you know, what does he want with Ukraine in your opinion? What is it that he's trying to recreate? People are saying he's trying to recreate the Soviet Union, but as you assess the situation, what is going on? From the very beginning, he felt Ukraine should be part of Russia. And most historians that look at Russia, I mean, they view it as a rather second rate player without Ukraine. With Ukraine, you have you know, the wheat, the industry, the talent. It's a much stronger and bigger country. You know, as it is, you know, I think the GDP of Russia is you know, like Spain's or France, and I don't remember exactly what, but you put Ukraine in. So he wanted that, but he's also been working diligently over the years to co-op all the countries around him. This is not a mystery. He wanted to rebuild. The only thing that's missing is communism. Until recently, until recently, when he's now going to denazify the denazification of the Ukraine. That sounds like some old Communist Party hack manual, right? So, but the idea of the great empire, Russia, and this, this has been his goal. But where did he sour? How did he... Be you know, how did he turn into a dark person? You know, the, the yeah, do you dark... agree with that? The assessment right now that people have that he's not the same person he was, you know, five years, 10 years ago. You know, it was startling to me or his meetings where he has his two generals responsible for the war, 40 feet away from him. Right. Yeah, I don't so know about you, but, you know, if you're in a command position, you're you're breathing on the people next to you. Right. You're you're drinking to the same the same same beer or whatever. So the fact that you would have them far away or you have your security council meeting videoed, pre-recorded so you could edit, he still didn't even edit it. They're 40 feet away and he's treating them as if they were strangers and it was very bizarre. So I don't know, um, you know, I've read a lot about him um, and you don't, what doesn't emerge is this dark side that, you know, I'm willing to kill uh, what will turn out to be thousands of, of innocent people put my own forces to at a war that was unjustified, thousands of Russian troops. I mean, this is a really hard and dark spot. And I don't know whether the past two years, and I'm not a psychiatrist, but living like a hermit, um, whether or not you have some pathology that's... Uh, repressed until you get into that isolation and you start thinking about Mother Russia over and over and getting the Ukraine over and over. And I think he's been playing very effectively. If you look at his role in Syria, his role taking the Crimea, you know, uh, developing, you know, a new relationship with China. If you were looking at it, you would say he has really empowered 
uh, himself and has made Russia sit at the table, make people pay attention to him. And today, uh, and I, I know you have had a chance to read it, but I, I have an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, which is, uh, well, what, is it, what it says, the main thesis is his, he was at his apex, apogee, if you like, you know, four or five days before he invaded because he was intimidating the world. He had 160,000 troops. You know, he was in a terribly powerful position with the Chinese and his, his own, uh, you know, self-sufficiency. And little did we know that his army wasn't nearly as good and that he had a crackpot view of how how things were going to play out in, uh, in, in the Ukraine. So I think that was his high watermark. And I think he is going to continue to diminish by the day. Now, the problem is I've seen over and over again, one of the big intelligence failures is we tend to um, underestimate how much pain people can live with before they decide to take action against their leaders. They can put up with a lot more. So I'm basically saying that the real end game here is not like, un it's not like a, uh, unlike Afghanistan, which is for the allies to hold together to support the Ukrainians to the maximum without getting into World War III. Keep the pressure on. He's going to go through his $635 billion faster than, than uh, you know, um, the bread man slicing bread. So it's um, his country is going to start crumbling around the edges and more and more dissatisfaction. You know, they were hoodwinked. How many Russians can really buy into this, the propaganda for a sustained period of time? So I think the real end game is, will the Russian people, you know, either come to the streets at some point or whether there'll be a cabal within his group saying, hey, wait a minute, we can do better than this. We can live better than this. And if you remember, Khrushchev, you know, had his big dust up with Kennedy and looked like he was the, the top of the heap because of the missile crisis. And, you know, but what happened to him is <laughs> when he came to the next meeting, they shut the door and arrested him right you were responsible for arming the afghans in the 1980s when the Af when the russians invaded afghanistan today what we're seeing is a, almost a very similar situation where the nato is coming together and they're saying you know we got to arm the ukrainians we're pushing weapons we're pushing stinger missiles javelin missiles i have two questions on this point one do you buy that putin really did not expect that NATO would unify and come together with an action like this. And second, you referenced World War III, and this is something I've been thinking about a lot, a lot about because nobody wants to say it, but we have a situation where the majority of the world, and especially Europe, is by and large involved in this. Whether they're not, they're overtly deploying troops. They're providing arms. And is this World War III? There is no place to hide today. There is no place to hide. He has changed. I mean, uh, his impact on history, you know, if Time Magazine, the man of the year, he's going to be the man of the year, but so was Hitler and Stalin. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean you're the good guy, but his impact on history and this um, left-footed effort is uh, going to be one of those great disasters in, in history and a uh, great tragedy sur surrounding it. I, I think he'll be judged... Uh, you know, they're very poorly by it. But the fact that you have a land war of major countries in Europe in 2022, and you look at the, the playing or the rolling out and think of World War II and even World War I, it's, it's scary stuff. I am impressed and very pleased with how NATO pulled together. Um, that the Germans cut off Nord Stream and that they're actually selling, uh, sending weapons, real weapons, the, the Swedes won in, the Finns. I mean, he didn't intend to do that, but that was the outcome. And I think what he was thinking of, he was going to go in and clean clean the Ukrainians' clock on a, on a long weekend. Mm -hmm. And if he knew he wasn't, then he would have probably come to the conclusion that we would have time to rally. And he's now in a really difficult place because he is a double-down guy. So he's not going to back off. There's not going to be a you know, a treaty where he leaves and only holds on to Donbass or something. And so, and I haven't looked at it. I, I want to be, I've just been swamped, but I'm going to find out who the 35 that abstained. I know yeah, <laughs> who I wants to that. be with, who the wants UN to be vote. with, 
with uh, North Korea and Belarus and so on. I get that. But who are the 35? How does India, you know, with its great history of democracy, doesn't stand up and scream at the top of its head? I know why, right? Because it's the, you know, the relationship with the Russians and weapons. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how the UAE doesn't stand, stand up. So I'm, I'm troubled by some of that. What does end it? And you you reference that he's not gonna he's not gonna back down. I mean, we see it, but what does end this? He's not gonna like this. He has to go. He has to go. Okay, that's the. Not, we're not gonna come up with a new treaty, right? We're not gonna have a new treaty. We're not gonna. It's not Yalta, right? We're not gonna come up and divide the, the world. He's got to go. He he's now crossed that line. There's no road back. I've been saying for years. No reason why we listen. We shouldn't be adversaries with Russia. We should be. They should be part of the European scheme. They should be part of the business arrangement in Europe, right? But his view was, nah, I don't trust you. I don't trust the, the world. I'm going to go back to the old world. And he took Russia uh, back to the old world, and he created single-handedly <laughs> a Cold War. So you know, the solution to it is he has to go. And I think what will happen, and that's what I'm saying in the, in the op-ed, is Eventually, your, people fall of their own weight. They have the seeds of their own failure. And what's going to happen is it's going to be increasingly unpopular. It's not going to be sustainable. And you'll either have a palace coup or the people will come out in the street. And this is the difference. When they come out in the street, if the Russian soldiers are, are going to push down on the citizens, he can stay in power. But there'll come a time... When they identify with the citizens and they refuse to shoot on their own people, and then he's gone. So there's no way he's going to turn his economy ever again into a strong economy. He's never going to have an intimidating military. You know, he's not. In other words, he missed. He missed that opportunity. You know, four or five, you know, several days ago to end and, and mark himself down as a really tough guy who then played brinkmanship and cut a deal. He lost that opportunity, and there's no way back. You know, maybe you get a ceasefire to help citizens, and maybe you can do this and the other, but he's stuck now with a terrible formula of having to occupy. Those Russian, Russian troops did not want to be in Afghanistan. I don't know if people realize they didn't want to be there. Yeah. They had terrible morale problems and drug problems, and they didn't want to be there. They're not going to want to be in, uh, in Ukraine. Russian soldiers will be, after a while, they will not want to be occupying it and walking down the street and not knowing what's around the corner. It's an ugly thing when you occupy a country. And the whole world's against them now, other than these 35 um, countries that abstain, <laughs> right. uh, which shame on them. And I hope they're not any of our allies or any of my personal friends. But, you know, I, I, I think this is a really defining moment in, 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 in modern history. And he has nuclear weapons, and everybody's now saying, is he going to use them? And this gets to your question, how sane is he? Mm -hmm. I always felt he was very, very sharp and practical. But I think I'm now worried that something happened during that COVID period that tapped into a bad side on him. And, and he doesn't look happy. He looks, there's just... But is he, so I don't think nuclear weapons will become an issue. It's just more of that saber rattling. It's Khrushchev taking his shoe off at the UN and pounding on the table. It's trying to scare the, it's old, so old. This is all stale. This is a hang, hangover from a different age. He's out of touch. And that's when you're down in your, your little bunker by yourself and you know, trying to replace history with something that it died. And you have to analyze why did the Soviet Union die? And why, if you put it back together, why will it not die again? So I think this, this Cold War will end the way the last one did. Is there a red line for the U.S.? At, at the point at which they say, like, we have to go in, we have to take action, we can't allow this to happen. In the day of nuclear weapon and mutual destruction, I don't think you have those kinds of red lines. And it all gets to, this is why so many people are spending time on the mental state of, of Putin. And I honestly am praying that he's sound, okay? Because the alternative is really scary. So if he starts going after the US with cyber, we will reciprocate in kind. Is he gonna take down a power grid? I mean, then I would say 
he's got he's, the, the the marbles are rolling around on the wrong side of the head. If he thinks he's going to start cyber attacks, we are quite well positioned to respond with any cyber thing he wants. But if he starts shooting Americans anywhere in the world, if he starts coming at us with cyber, we will respond. But this is why I come back. This is the most dangerous point, and I've lived a long life. <laughs> but this is one of the most dangerous points in, in history. You know, I did, I was around as a kid at the Bay of Pigs, which was, to me, that wasn't really life-threatening. What was, was the missile crisis. You know, that was, that was really close. And even, even in the early days of World War, of the Cold War, the Russians were so much weaker than the U.S. in terms of nuclear power and all of that. I don't think we were ever at the real brink. But today, you have a guy with nuclear weapons who's really got himself boxed in. And uh, and that's why I think it's so dangerous. It's so important that the Allies are communicating, working together. You know, when you put all that brain power together and the different interests, we whatever red line it'll be a it'll be a it'll be a red line minus nuclear weapons because I can't you can't get there. That can't be that can't be your red line. Otherwise, you're living in a mad world. Jack, you mentioned the Cold War. You know, we are certainly, as you just said, you know, at the brinksmanship of you know, certainly greater than I've ever seen in my life. And it's so telling that, you know, you said in, in your life, you don't know a time that we've been where we are. But, you know, spoken by a true Cold Warrior yourself, one of the greatest legendary spies of our time, our nation owes you the greatest debt, as I've said before, in all of our conversations. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for breaking down this problem. Leadership's about solving complex challenges. You remain one of the greatest leaders in the Spy Master game, and everybody has to check out Spy Master Prism. We talked about it in episode 13. More relevant today than it was a year ago when we spoke for sure, but great book. Thank you, Jack. It was a pleasure as always. 